What's up everybody? Jason from Jason's Exotic Reptiles. Today I'm up here at New England Reptile Distributors and I have a really unique opportunity to have both Brian Barchek and Kevin McCurley present. So if you don't know, Kevin McCurley owns New England Reptile Distributors and Brian Barchek decided to come up and he was going to potentially do some, some videos with Kevin. Or I'm not sure exactly what he's doing, but I do know that he's up here. I'm hoping I can go in, convince both of them to sit down and do an interview with me and uh, we get some content for this channel. I'm going to ask them some real simple questions, but some good ones that I think you guys will appreciate. So let's take this video inside. Let's see what I can do. What's up everybody, Jason from Jason's Exotic Reptiles. Today I'm here with Kevin McCurley and Brian Barchek. I'm up at NERD, New England Reptile Distributors, who's owned by Kevin McCurley, with Brian Barchek from BHB Reptiles. I got a really unique opportunity to have both of these guys in the same place to ask some kind of simple questions. Not everybody's going to love them, but I hope you guys at least appreciate the effort and get some of these simple questions, get to know these guys a little bit better for who they are, as opposed to what you may see on the internet and some of the stories and rumors. So, yeah. so, so here we go. So I got a list. There's some simple questions. No peeking. I'm going to just um, like answer different questions. Like you ask a question, I'll just like pizza. Yeah, so when we, I was we don't even know when I was any of these questions. So we might. <laughs> All right, let's do it. Yeah. So they, they know none of these questions. My favorite and, uh, color is blue. What? Yeah. What's your favorite color? <laughs> no. But, so, so again, they're going to be simple questions. I guess question number one is. Maybe we'll start with Brian. Yeah. Is what was your first official reptile that you kept as a pet? So not something that you had as like you went out in the yard and yeah. caught it. Uh, something that you actually went out and purchased and said, you know, I'm I'm going to set this up as a reptile. Yeah, it's crazy. You know, I mean, and like you said, I I spent my whole childhood in the woods catching snakes and and, and frogs, toads. Uh, but my mom wouldn't let me keep anything indoors. You know, I couldn't keep anything inside, so I keep them outside in the garage in boxes. And then all went, the, all went through. Yeah, yeah. and then, then like in this, it was always so sad when I went back to school because I'd have to release them, you know? But so my first, <laughs> it was crazy, my first reptile that I was able to buy, my mom let, my mom let me was, uh, I was on my 15th birthday, it was a Burmese python, a baby Burmese python. Horrible first pet. Don't ever buy a Burmese python for your first pet. Uh, but back then, honestly, that was, you know, a long time ago, obviously. There was no internet, so we didn't, you know, I thought the thing got like six, seven foot because that's what the pet shop told me. And uh, I, I loved it. I mean, I kept, that, really, that animal is what, uh, kind of spawned a, a love affair of big snakes my whole life. And was it a normal? Was it a morse? I mean, it was, oh, there was no morse back then. It was just a normal wild caught to boot, you know? So yeah. It was a baby, you know, it had mites and ticks and everything else. And About how long ago was that? Eight. It was, uh, I was 15, uh, that was uh, 1980, uh, what is it? 1984. Wow. I was born in 87. Yep, 84, so that was my first snake. And then how about you, Kevin? What was your first 12 years, 12 years old. It was a Colombian boa constrictor. Oh, there you I go. named it Rodan because I oh, used to watch the show called Creature Double Feature, and I was very much into Godzilla. Oh, I love that. Oh, my so God. So Rodan, yeah. So then I later on got a female named Nadine, but it was like 79, 99. And when I got this, I also got two wild-caught gopher snakes. What's interesting about the gopher snakes, they had a very hard time getting them to feed, and very quickly I lost one of them. So, oh, about a year later, I heard the people across the street, the kids yelling and ah, making all you know noise, and I'm like, oh, whatever. And they're like, snake, snake. I'm like, what the hell? I go over, and it is my other gopher snake. Oh my gosh. That wouldn't eat because this one snake just would not eat, and had been loose for about a year, and it, it was like beautiful, <laughs> and it was and it was crazy psycho. Oh my But it was, it was it was pretty funny. That's crazy. It's and a different world back then. I couldn't even read your questions. It looks like a little two-year-old post those things. Fast. You can ask him how many times he's been asked that same question. I write fast. I write fast. Uh, so what was the reptile keeping industry or hobby like when you guys first started? So this is kind of, uh, it's obviously changed and evolved, and we discussed yeah. this a little bit earlier, and it, it's, it's much different than it is today than, or than it was back then. So who wants to start? Because I'll let you guys pick this one. 
Yeah, I mean, I'll go first. Um, you know, it was so different. I mean, obviously, no one was doing it for a living. You know, there, there was no aspirations like you were going to breed snakes for a living. That, that wasn't even a, a potential. You know, the best thing you could do is if you did breed snakes, you might trade it off to another guy for another snake or make 20 bucks on it or something like that. So it, that part was it. So there was no, like, uh, it was hard. You, know, you wouldn't go out and spend $2,500 on a snake rack because there were no manufactured snake racks. But if there were, you couldn't justify it because, you know, so we kept things really simply. Um, no rack systems back then. I mean, when you did keep it in a, a, a plastic box, it had a lid, you know, with holes and duct tape or something like that. And it was pretty rudimentary back then, but we were learning, you know, I mean, there, there, you got to remember there were oh, so many species of snake that had never even been bred back then, let alone available. All, all of them. Yeah, mo yeah, almost all of them. I mean, retics when we were young, which, uh, you, know, got, you know, obviously Kevin was hugely responsible for the tame retics we have now, I mean, when we were kids, all they were wild caught and they were in the meanest, most satanic, they didn't want to eat. They were <laughs> very psycho. Yeah, they yeah. got that bad reputation. And, uh, so, a different world back then. So, I can remember a couple of things. So, my first snake, the boa constrictor, I kept it on natural and purple gravel because I thought yeah, that was yeah, a nice yeah, color yeah, thing. Use a heating <laughs> pad for your back, kept it in a 50 gallon uh, breeder tank, which is 36 by 18. And uh, so, you buy a heating pad at CVS. And um, put like a big dog dish in there. You have screen top with clips or all sorts of different weight. And it was very interesting. So as I end up keeping snakes, we're always keeping them in fish tanks. And uh, I was using cereal boxes as hide boxes. Yeah. Yep. Newspaper. I was disinfecting the cages with, with Listerine. Oh, <laughs> like nice. Listerine and all this different stuff. And it was really terrible. But um, being in a herb society, that was my first exposure. Yeah. Because at the yeah. pet store, they had yeah. this little thing for New England herb. And New England herb, I grew up in New England herbs. So I'm the product of all these other people that are keeping animals and gaining knowledge from them. Or just the motivation of seeing, you know, adults with these amazing animals. So my dad being very responsible was like, well, we should go join the Herp Society and it's a good thing. You can get your food animals there, meet all these like-minded people. Poor guy did not know what he got himself yeah, into because yeah. I was obsessed. Yeah. So I'm doing a Herp Society, meeting people like Tom Spadaro, people that had like African rock pythons and all these different stuff. And I'm just like, wow. And just going to these meetings and you get somebody just come in here and just talk about, you know, boa constrictors in the wild. So you yeah. start doing this. But there was no techniques at all. It was like people weren't really breeding stuff. If they were breeding stuff, it was by mistake. Yeah. But you know, getting a, a Colombian rainbow boa was like amazing and an Afrock or a retic or just seeing that stuff was amazing. But n there, there was nothing. There was yeah. literally nothing. Yeah. And the mistakes that we did were uh, huge. And I just remember just uh, just trying to figure out how to do all this different stuff. And it's, it's like such a learning curve. And that's why I have just so much uh, info ingrained in my brain because I've made all these mistakes. Yeah, right now it's, no, it's kind yeah. of out there. It's out, it's out on the internet. Oh, people, it's people so much easier. There's such a kindness that. that everybody has now to get some reliable information and hopefully us involved here, we, we give very credible information because I think we're all... But know, I do miss the Herb keepers. Society days, you know, and, and that, I, I, coming up, I was the I, same I, way. I think it's keen yeah. and I would always recommend everybody to join the New England Herb Society yeah. uh, of it, it, it's so important, and it's shrunk down so sadly. And there's really good quality yeah, the face people. Yeah, face-to-face stuff is, is so much. It's just better to met, have mentors that you can go to. And, yes. and, and and I used to love it. As a matter of fact, you know, we're expanding our zoo right now. When that's done, I want to open up a herb society in the area that we can have meetings at my. We were, we're always thinking like that. And the Kurt yeah. Schatzel is my buddy who does own herb society. You know, I, I wouldn't have like mixed feelings because I know we could make a. Herb yeah. Society, because all of my fan base and, and all this different stuff. Yeah. But I would really love for people just to be involved because yeah. uh, legislation and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. You need to call people together, and when you Herb Societies are one of your first go tos that are going to uh, talk to fish and game yeah. and stuff like that. So they're important. So every state should have a Herb Society. But sadly, people always think inwardly, and they're not thinking outwardly. And I always talk about trying to think outwardly. But your Herb Societies are very important. They're generally nonprofit. They have some kind of link to state legislature or just, you know, uh, fishing game or yeah. something like and, that. And I know, Kevin, you've done a lot of things with the legislations and you've, you've been very, uh, you've been an activist for us in the, the reptile community for a long time. Ryan, I know yourself as well. Um, so, so that's, I think that's all important is these, these herb societies, they, they really do bring us together, give us a chance, the, the younger keepers, to learn from more experienced keepers in person rather than through a YouTube video or through the internet yeah. uh, where you don't get that like personal one way, connection. One way, you're not getting back and forth. Yeah, Absolutely. 100%.
So I guess going into the next one, was what is what would you consider as your, your greatest accomplishment? Another question that you've probably gotten a lot, but what is your greatest accomplishment and worst failure throughout all the years of, of what makes you the proudest that you've done and, and some things that I don't want to say you feel bad about, but things that you that, that would be maybe maybe a good success could be the failure. Maybe that could be your best accomplishment and your worst failure. Yeah. That's a tough one for me, man. I'll be honest with you. You know, I I, I uh I always have problems with like accolades and thinking that, you know, so what my greatest accomplishment in, in business or in keeping, uh, it's so hard for me to say. I mean, I, I guess right now, if I had to pick right now, it would be opening up the Reptarium because, you know, it, it, number one, it wasn't financial based when I did it. I didn't even know if I was going to pay the bills with it. You know, I didn't know if I was going to break even with it. It's turned out. I remember, I remember the whole thing of him building it yeah. and, you know, the money things like if I could just kind of just. Yeah, if I could just pay the bill, he was literally it, about yeah. that. He would never even dreamt about it. Actually, I never. Making yeah, I mean, money. I spent a lot of money, and I didn't think I, I didn't think I was ever going to make that money back. And ironically enough, we did make uh, a good amount of money back. But but now we put every dollar that we made back into doing it again. Yeah. Uh, so now you know, but but it's never been about That's money. That's a sign of a real but, reptile freak. Well, you yeah, know, I just love passion. it. Yeah, I, I just love it. And the fact that you know, when people come to visit, they see that we can. You know, like every day we're open, there's kids coming in, and they're so, I mean, they, you know, where can you go to hold a snake or a lizard or an alligator? And um, and, and you see that them brighten up, and you know those are going to be future reptile lovers. And yeah. So I think I, if I had to pick, that's probably the thing. As far as failures, I've had so many failures. I mean, from, from um, you know, obviously, biz, you know, breeding to, to, you know, keeping animals improperly, not knowing what I was doing when I had a species, to, to, uh, to obviously Internet stuff that I failed on, you know, like... Uh, uh, I mean, so I couldn't say there's one in particular. It's probably too many for to, to even mention, yeah. to be honest with you. But I think that's that's something that, as a as a person, you need to accept that failing is is part of succeeding, right? Absolutely. You know, so uh, so if you are not failing, you're not trying. Absolutely. Yeah, so I'm a that, big I'm a big yeah. fan of that one. That's yeah. um, that's 100 percent true. Yeah. Will Smith once said, "Fail forward." You know. Yeah. That's, what, that's what I try to do. Yeah. Well, uh, and I see Kevin. He's going crazy over here, ready to answer. No. So Kevin. So I, I would probably say my biggest success was actually able to take my little hobby that I had stuffed away in a room, and then I was able to create this thing, this big giant 14,000 square foot building filled with reptiles. But for me to be able to take my hobby, I still reflect, even when Brian was out here, and I'm just like, so Brian just drove here to see me and see my cool animals. And Brian has seen everything. It's kind of a little, little weird. It's a little surreal that I have no. all these amazing animals, and I have a history of making animals where I'm actually known around the world. That's kind of like a little bit surreal. It's, it's a bit humbling, too. But it's also, at some point, you have to, you know, like, wow, I actually did this. So to be able to take my abilities and somehow hone them where I can actually build a business, have employees, and own zoo creatures, New England reptile, and get to play with these animals and be able to acquire things like my leucistic king cobra that is like the, like I'm the only person in the world that was able to, to you know, get that. And it's now maybe going to go into a breeding project if I'm successful. And that will once again start something totally new. Yeah, uh, greatest, because of this. greatest failures I have... So many failures. Uh, what we do is generally, you know, you have animals, you have deaths of animals. Sometimes you actually, I should have done this, and instead I did this, or you have all this different thing. And those are the things that you repeat in your mind when you're trying to sleep. And uh, it really tears me up, like all these different, like, things that have gone wrong. Uh, so there's so many of them. And um, we are dealing with live animals, so... There's a lot of things that you're removed from as far as affecting that animal's life. You know, you get something, an animal in. I remember Brian's gets an albino savanna monitor and, and literally 24 hours it yeah. dies. And yeah, it, he has nothing hours. to do with that. So there's yeah. so many failures. So we try to do our yeah. best not to uh, think of, of those, but there's yeah. plenty. They can't right. stop you from making the next purchase, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or the next, you know, swing at the fence, you know. If you're afraid to, to fail, you're never going to succeed. I thought I was going to have the biggest failure of my life on Thanksgiving because oh, no. if that shipment came in cold, oh, and, and it, it, I mean, it was shipped Monday. I didn't get it until Thursday and it had been bounced all over the place. No heat packs, no nothing, and just 
Literally, doing this. I tell you, said it no recourse. Right. I swear, gosh, I would have picked up and driven it here if you wanted. I, I, you could that, have called that, me. You're saying that. Like, I, I really would have driven it here. That's how much I. That would, would have been perfect because Brian came here to meet. Lucy yeah, yeah, yeah. I could have came right you. Oh my gosh. But yeah, it's crazy. Well, it's that crazy. could have been my worst failure because they could have all the, that entire beautiful shipment could have been dead and. Well, I failed. Maybe, maybe, no maybe it's one of your greatest accomplishments yes, in the future. We'll yes. So I guess uh, we spoke a little bit about the industry earlier and how, and how it's changed and evolved. If there was one thing about the industry and the hobby in general that we could change today uh, that you've seen through through all the years, uh, what would you change about it? Maybe it's not one thing. Maybe it's a couple things. But but what would you? I don't want to say what disappoints you, but what disappoints you? What would you like to see evolve? Uh, to become better amongst all of us or, or change in general in the hobby itself? Yeah, I think that for me, um, you know, number one, we always can be better. You know, I mean, you know, animals are always, you know, when you're dealing with animals, you always can be better, you know. I think uh, from housing to husbandry to everything, we can do better. That being said, I think that to me, the thing that has always been the biggest disappointment is, is kind of the uh, us against them mentality. The fact that we, you know, we all have this unbelievable passion for a very unusual thing which is reptiles and amphibians and um, and and you know bugs as well and and yet you know there's so much hate and vitriol in the industry and to me I think it doesn't you know they're, they're, you're never going to get along with everyone but you should respect everybody and, and even people that have done me extremely wrong and trust me in 32 years of business I've had a lot of people do me really wrong um, you know I still try to respect everything you know I mean it's it's like um, and and I, I think it's not a good I, I guess what I'm saying is I want everyone my mission in life is for people to love these animals period this is what I want. I want people to even, I always say if, if people could see 10% of the love I have for these animals, they may give them a chance. And, and I, I hate that new people come into the hobby and they get involved in a Facebook group and then they ask a reasonable beginner question and get attacked for being a newbie. Flaming, and, absolutely. Um, and yeah. I think that that's, that's the part I don't like is like, we should, I, I mean, I've been doing this for 32 years and the one thing that even my staff is always surprised by is how I will give the, an enthusiastic answer to the same question 10,000 times because I know I asked that question when I was their age or, or it doesn't even matter age just you know getting into the industry and if we were a little bit more welcoming to people wanting to come in I think the hobby itself would be so much better off and, and so that's that's the thing that bothers me the most yeah and how about you Kevin I have a lot of gripes <laughs> and I'm like you know rifling through yeah. them but uh, a couple of my gripes would be um, people that keep these animals and they always are thinking inwardly. Uh, these animals, we are losing our rights yeah. to be able to keep these legislation-wise, uh, availability-wise. And people, like when all of a sudden, like a state, a city, or a federal, or whatever, and they want to have new legislation, I am so literally disappointed with our industry and the hobby sector that people just like, ah, I'll let somebody else take care of that. Yeah. They, they won't be vocal, they won't yeah. sign something, they won't get involved. And let somebody like me, and I am going to be 1,000%, you know, forward on it, and I'll try to do what I can, but I don't get the support. I, I, I don't get the support, so I'm out there like, yeah, like Kevin's got this. And it's like, you guys are crazy. I'm a busy guy, yeah. and I'm obsessed with it. So if we do the federal invasive injurious snake thing, I was totally on that. I was on that for years, yeah. and all this different stuff. And people are always, like, letting somebody else do the heavy yeah. lifting, and I really dislike that. And some of those people... What's amazing is people take the time and the energy to go and shit talk yeah. or talk smack. Like, you know, I've, you've certainly seen it. They'll do <laughs> no, all this nasty stuff. It. And it's like, wow, you have all the energy to bring attention to yourself or take pot shots. And you, it doesn't even matter if, if your narrative is even truthful or if it's even real. You're just like, I took this one little snippet and we can just twist it around and I'm going to use that as my, my lance and I'm going to throw it. I am disgusted by that. So you can take all the energy to do this stuff, but you can't be on the same team. Because you know when the whole thing's all said and done, we're all, I don't care if this other person I dislike so much, and, but they're keeping animals and I'm keeping animals and now we have this legislation or whatever, we're all on the same team. And I don't want to get along with everybody, but when you <laughs> literally can't even be bothered, I, I really get disgusted. I sit there and look at you and I'm like, you didn't do Anything. So I like most things in life. And today. I hate that. But I really, I don't like the uh, internet uh, experts. Where somebody can take 
they're, they're, they're like devaluing my abilities and what I know. And they're like, eh, you know, yeah, you have a lot of animals, yeah. And they're just like, wow, you don't understand how involved I am, what I actually know. But then they'll give credit to somebody else who is nothing, who's a fraud, who's a fake. That makes me yeah. mental because I'll know, I'm like, so you're equating me or I'm below somebody that I have such little regard to and mine's legit. And their people are just so simple-minded. They're like, well, you do this and do that. You guys are like the same, or that guy's even better than you. That's really sad because I look at the people like the Eugene Bissett, David Tracy Barker, uh, you know, you have Pete Calls, and all these different people that have been in this industry for a long time, and I give them credit, even if it's somebody who's my competitor. Brian, you're my co competition. Yeah. You literally are, well, and I don't ever care. Yeah, ever. especially in the early days when it, when ball pythons were really popping, we were really competitors, but yet we were still best of friends. Yeah, we. I, I don't. We I don't fight care. That, that, you know, I don't that, care, that, but stuff. it's like, but a lot of people in our industry, they're like backstabbing, nasty. Just, just, just the, some of the stuff is just rather vile so, and, and maybe, uh, underhanded. I hate it. Maybe that's a big change that's happened in the industry as well today. Is that uh, back in the kind of the earlier days when the breeding started, there's a lot of people who were working together, trying to uplift each other uh, in a way in a competitive in a competitive mm, spirit. Not quite like that. Well, yeah, there no, was there was a there, lot of there was a lot of hatred towards no, people, but but, at, but I think there egos. Was, yeah, so egos think, were big, but there was still I think a lot of respect. You know, I remember. Um, not to out anybody, but I remember. I'm not going to. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so, uh, like Mark Bell oftentimes didn't have the highest regard for Tracy Barker, you know. But yet, when Tracy would do something significant, he would be the first person to call and congratulate her. Um, and and I think that was something that. Oh, my God. Yeah, I, I, just, I just think there should be a respect, you know. And I respect. Hey, I respect uh, the, the the 15, 16, 17 year old kid getting into this industry that has the passion I had when I was a kid. But. Um, but he's got he or she has a lot to learn, and I'm there to help learn. But uh, don't you know, like Kevin said, I mean, I th I think sometimes people say, well, just because you've been doing something for 30 years doesn't mean that uh -huh. you know something. It's yes. like no, it kind of does mean that because if you've been doing it successfully for 30 years, you have to be doing it right or at least so somewhat right. It doesn't mean you don't evolve. I'm not saying that, but to to say that someone that's been doing it for two years has the same experience is just it's just it inaccurate. Is, it's, it, it it, it's literally a thumbnail of the best <laughs> movie in the world. It's <laughs> and comparing is, the two. That, that is, is the ridiculous. mindset of kind of uh, of people. I don't even want to say of a generation, but generally of of people with less experience and and uh, coming up. I mean, I I do engineering for a living, and a lot of the younger engineers in general they say. Uh, you bring them in on the interview, which some people may say this is kind of like an interview, but you bring them in on the interview and they, they get into the, the fact that I ask them, what do you know? And they think they know everything. And I think that's the first piece is you don't know what you don't know. Right. And those are the things that as you evolve and as you gain that 30 years experience, you begin to understand. Keeping a lot of reptiles is incredibly humbling. It yeah. is very humbling and, and you learn a lot. I mean, definitely when I was 20 years old, I, I'm sure I thought I knew it all. And if I had the knowledge I had now 20 years ago, I would tell the, the younger Brian, you don't know anything. <laughs> you know, And it uh, and, uh, doesn't mean we don't still need to learn. And, and quite frankly, my business, let me just back up for one second. My success of my, my overall business, not, not necessarily direct reptile breeding, uh, was for me learning from 20-year-old kids. Yeah. Okay? So I really respect young kids uh, that are passionate, and they taught me how to do social media well and, and took me to where I want to go. So I would never disparage the younger generation and say, you don't know as much. I'm just saying that you know we all can learn, and, and, and sometimes uh, throwing darts at people that have been around a long time is easy, yes. but not necessarily uh, the best for the hobby. <laughs> so, so this may actually be a good transition, because this video is getting kind of long. I really appreciate yeah. you guys doing yeah, this. We talk a lot. But, uh, <laughs> but the, a good question that I, is, if you could give one piece of advice to anybody new coming into the industry or into the hobby in general, somebody who wants to get a pet, pet snake or wants to start breeding, um, what would you do? What, what would that piece of advice be? Let me start. Uh, I, I, this, you, you might be surprised by this because I, I talk a lot of times like I, I love animals, but I also am a student of business. Uh, but the one that I personally believe is that if you want to get into reptiles, especially if you want to do it as an advanced hobby slash business, first things first, don't do it for the money. If the money comes, you know, there's a saying that says, you know, do what you love and the money will come. That is true. If you get into reptiles for money, you, you've already lost. You will not do well, and your animals are going to suffer. 
money is always secondary, much like the Reptarium. You know, I spent $125,000 opening the place up. Never thought I'd get a penny of it back because all I want to do is something I love. Yeah. You know, and it's been successful, which is great, but I'm just saying the same thing with the animals. And, and uh, I tell you what, like, I will never, and my crew will attest to this to every single one, I will never walk. I, if, if my crew came up and said, Brian, we need this, I will never say no. If the animals are going to benefit, so my point is never put money in front of the animals or you will fail. Yeah, and, and I think, Kevin, I know you, you definitely agree with a lot of that, if not all of it. But uh, do you have anything that you would, you would say differently or uh, um, what people would you give? When you're getting into this and you want to, you have the reptile madness, and you just, I just, I just want everything and all this stuff like that. It, it is, it I don't focus very well. It doesn't stop, by the way. But yeah, <laughs> but you, you, you um, want to get all these different things. So a couple of things I could say about that. Try to think about once you have, like, you know, I have a toge gecko and I have a boa constrictor and a king snake. At some point, target what you're actually trying to achieve. Like, if you have all these different random animals that are all have different unique uh, ecos systems or niches of what they like, you're kind of making life a little bit harder. But if you actually immediately start to coordinate, well, I'm going to keep, you know, these day geckos, and then you have multiple cages or whatever, I think that's very important. But another thing is uh, reptile shows. Reptile shows are swap meets. You go to these shows. You don't have any uh, rapport often with the people. I mean, some you might go to the same reptile show and see the guy every every time. But when you start just mindlessly buying from different people, you are opening yourself up to problems mm -hmm. because you're just buying because it's the cheapest thing. I was just looking at my YouTube things. Why is this? Why is New England's reptiles prices <laughs> so high or something like that? So I guess if I buy a cheap animal and it doesn't look so good, but it's cheap, I take it home and it dies. Isn't it still dead? Or if I spend a little bit more money to get something that's like really nice and we know the people where it comes from and all that stuff, and then a year later it's still alive. I think no matter how cheap that other one was, it's still dead. People don't seem to understand this. They do not understand this at all. But I just went there and I got this and I got that, and now there's these nasty viruses going around. Oh, yeah. I have a friend of mine, his entire collection. He kept on going to shows. I'm like, oh man, you know, whatever. And he's like, oh, I found this for this and this and that. And all of a sudden, he's calling me up. Oh my God, all my snakes are dying, and this is horrible, and what do I do? And I'm like, oh, I know what that is. And, and he's like, 10 died today, 12 died yesterday, and all the different stuff. So when you start dealing with less people, so whoever it is, deal with your quality breeders, whoever it is, but establish a report with them. Listen to what they suggest. When you're getting your husbandry techniques, listen to them. Listen to somebody who's successful. Don't just sit here and go all over the internet and get all those little bits of information because what kills me, I breed these animals, I breed them multiple generations. I pretty much know how to dial these animals in. This is how you take care of them. And I send it to somebody and they go and hybridize my care with somebody else's or well I thought so instead of doing this I did this and then the animal's not eating or the animal's now crazy or whatever it's like so you didn't listen that's one reason why I do all the videos I do the videos so people can go understand what I'm talking about my ideas and please read read like if I write something read it if I do a video listen to what I'm saying that makes me mental People comment. I'm like, did you even watch the video? How? <laughs> it makes me it makes me really upset because we're putting out good information and they're not getting it because their attention span is out of a gnat. My attention is out of a gnat, but I still kind of pull it together. Yeah, no, that's great. Right? Do you have anything else to add to that? Or? Well, I think that just to build on what Kevin said about the the brand, you know, is is uh, there's a couple things. You know, what's the difference between you know uh, a cheap shoe and Nike? You know, I mean, it's the brand. And one of the things that you got to remember is that a brand like Kevin and, and BHB, for instance. We have the ability, if something does go wrong, not only to help you, but if it does go wrong, we have the ability to make it right. Oftentimes, uh, someone maybe that you're buying from a swap, they're just one bad deal away from being out of business. You know, heaven forbid someone bought something for me <coughs> for a significant amount and, and it passed away. We take care of that, you know, whereas a, 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 maybe the swap me guy, they can't. You know, they just, they don't have the ability. I've been a victim of it. I've yeah, bought, I've done it too. Trust I bought me. somebody's two pet animals and I destroyed my whole breeding project on a, a, a project because I was stupid. Yeah. I trusted something and I believed something and I did something really dumb and it will forever kill me. That's one of Kevin's worst failures. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I don't want to keep going on this. I really appreciate you guys taking the time awesome. to do this with me. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Thank you, Brian, so much for doing this. Thanks, and um, <laughs> we'll catch you guys later. If you, you probably know who they are, if you know me, you definitely know who they are. But make sure you check out their YouTubes and check out their channels. Uh, New England Reptile <laughs> Distributors, Brian Barchek, Snake Bites TV, and all that other fun stuff. We'll talk to you guys soon. See you Say guys. goodbye. You should both kiss them. That would be, <laughs> <laughs> That'd be the best thing that I ever did.